Right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fifth presentation of the GA 2020 virtual series. Thank you again for joining us. This week's guest presenter is Dr. Sophia Edwards. Um, Sophia is the um, Australian and New Zealand business unit manager for Vetoquinol and is a technical specialist for large animal re uh, reproduction. Sophie has vast experience in management of reproduction programs to maximise genetic gain and production of beef and dairy cattle herds. So welcome Sophia and thank you for joining us. Thanks Claire. Uh, this is my first time doing a Zoom webinar. I've done plenty of Zoom uh, meetings of late so uh, hopefully everything's in order and I've got the technological side of things going. Um, so thank you for everybody uh, coming on this evening. Just get my slides working. Uh, so as um, Claire introduced myself, I'm Dr. Sophia Edwards. Uh, I work for Vetoquinol Australia, New Zealand. Uh, in my previous life, I actually uh, worked for the University of Queensland where um, I worked with my PhD around synchronization of cattle. Um, particularly in the north in Bosnicus animals and then I extended that work um, with Meat and Livestock Australia through a postdoc. Um, so in my previous life I was a researcher um, and now um, helping lead the team um, at Vetoquinol um, with our range of reproduction. Uh, so this evening Claire's given me the topic of the world of repro technology and um, it's, it's quite a topic to cover within um, 30 to 40 minutes so um, hopefully we can hold on to our seats. Uh, just to give you a bit of an outline of um, my topic today, uh, I'll just briefly go over what we can expect from the world of reproduction in the next 10 years. Um, 10 years is actually not a long time when you think about things, you can blink and um, miss it. Uh, talk about fixed time AI and why it's important. I'm assuming most of you probably uh, have some sort of understanding of what fixed time AI is, but I'd like to just show you some practical um, and some actual results um, that demonstrate those benefits. And then I'd like to talk through the protocols and procedures um, to ensure farmers are going to get some value for money. Uh, within the scope of this presentation, it's probably very difficult for me to go into the, the nitty gritty and the ins and outs of protocols. Um, but hopefully what I'll do is equip you with some questions and tools um, to better equip you have a discussion with your veterinarian um, or your AI provider. Um, and obviously I'm more than happy to help um, beyond the, this presentation with anyone that has um, any questions. So moving forward to what we expect the world of reproduction to deliver within the next 10 years. And uh, I'd like to probably talk about it with respect to our food supply regions. Um, and if we think about the biggest exporters or the, the countries that are producing food for the world, we can sort of split them between um, two, two groups roughly, um, talking about Canada, USA, Australia, and New Zealand. These countries are definitely uh, a volume focused um, industries, but they're also interested in quality. Uh, the others, um, if we wanted to throw them into a bucket, would be China, India, Latin America. Um, these sorts of regions, you would argue, are more focused on volume, um, more so than quality. And if we think about how I would see the repro technologies moving forward uh, in these areas is I really feel that particularly for the, the areas that are focused on quality, that we'll see the world of assisted reproduction and genomics merge. Um, at the moment, I would argue that genomics and, and assisted reproduction technologies are, are working um, independently. Um, but what I would see is definitely a lot more crossover um, and, and integration there and the importance of those um, improving. The other thing is I think that there's a lot of technologies that we um, are now utilising that um, have a lot more scope to grow. And a perfect example of that would be sex sorted semen. Um, I think you could argue that there's reasonable adoption throughout the dairy industry, but uh, I would argue that there's very little, there's a lot of expansion uh, possible in the beef worlds. Um, similar for technologies like IVF and embryo transfer I definitely could see that these countries um, 
improving and that would be on the back of um, genomics and selection of superior animals. If we then um, think about other regions of the world and those that might be more regulated or more about internal consumption, uh, we could think of, you know, particularly the areas such as Europe, and this also does apply to other regions such as the USA, um, Australia, New Zealand, in terms of the regulated aspects. Um, but what we see in these regions is a lot more consumer pressure on um, agricultural practices. And, and in that respect, um, you know, and I think this has resonated in a couple of the presentations um, throughout this virtual conference, is the fact that we basically, the way we do business in agriculture nowadays is actually as, as a reflection of our consumer pressures. Uh, and if we think about that from assisted reproduction point of view, it certainly comes down to hormone use. We're, we're already seeing that. Um, and the welfare and management of, um, of the animals. And I could definitely, within the assisted reproduction space, provide examples in each of these. Uh, I definitely think data, big data and information tools are, are going to come to the fore. Um, and these are only just starting. If you think about the emergence of animal wearables and what have you, um, I would say they're only at the beginning of it. Um, and as I said, these technologies are available, but in the next 10 years, I really see that they'll, they'll start to be implemented and used as, as common management. Um, in these regions, I, though, I think the, the role of genetics will certainly um, become more apparent. And I think that this is really due to the fact that because of this um, way that we need to do agriculture, um, that we will have to have some more value added um, products to offset the consumer demand. Uh, I, it was an interesting um, comment once I heard from Jason Strong, now the head of MLA. Um, he, he said that Australia, although we are big exporters, certainly can't uh, um, you know, produce enough to feed, say, Asia. But what we can be is the delicatessen um, for, for the world. And, um, you know, this is really where we're talking about that value added product and ensuring that we do have um, that quality. And to me, that's synonymous with um, genetic improvement. There's lots of other cool technologies um, on the brink. Um, there probably some may or may not um, become realities um, within the next 10 years. Um, gene editing, um, new drug delivery systems, uh, the sperm capsules being one that's been floating around forever, but um, I haven't seen it commercialised. Um, basically, where sperm cells are encapsulated um, and released at a slow point in time um, in the tracks so you don't need synchronisation. Um, I think there's room for improvement in IVF technologies, um, semen storage techniques, um, sperm function tech, um, assessments, you know, why balls give us better results than others. Um, another cool one was surrogate size, um, essentially where the, the sperm cells of a um, one bull can be placed into the testicles of another bull and essentially that bull then is um, ejaculating um, sperm cells that have high genetic merit. And a, and a perfect example of this could be, say, a Brahmin bull in the north with Angus genetics. Um, is tropically adapted and enabling crossbreeding. So these things are there, but whether or not they'll be, um, you know, fully implemented in the next 10 years is, um, is another question. So I'd just like to move on to um, the next part of my presentation and around fixed time AI. Um, I'm going with a little bit of assumption that most on the call have a reasonable understanding of fixed time AI. So um, I'll just pro provide some benefits of it um, and, and discuss about it to give me some more time for the other topics. So the purpose of fixed time AI, and I mean at its true sense, is that we do not need to do any heat detection. Uh, the, the purpose of fixed time AI is that you can synchronise all females and 100% of them um, can be submitted forward to AI. Um, those that would be familiar with heat detection programs would understand that submission rates to AI uh, are not 100%. This is due to cows that may or may not be cycling um, or the fact that we just don't pick up on heats. Now, when I say there's no need for heat detection, um, it's, it's optional. Um, there's certainly, and I'll discuss later, that there are um, checks and balances and things that we can do. Um, and certainly if anyone chimed into Kai Pola's um, presentation last week, 
um, there's things that we can do to, to increase our reliability or our, our bang for our buck in these programs. Uh, fixed time AI is um, excellent because you can pre-plan uh, a time and a date well in advance, um, which is good for breeding management, but also if you do need to use, say, contract labour um, or what have you. The thing about fixed time AI is uh, it always produces more calves by AI. Now, the simple fact is because we're submitting more females to AI, we will always get more calves. So there is a difference when we interpret um, pregnancy rates and conception rates. Um, the synchrony treatments in fixed time AI programs often are a good treatment for non-cyclers. Um, so if you're dealing with postpartum anestrus in your herds, um, it, it can be a remedy for that. Uh, the other interesting thing is that females will conceive, if you program it this way, um, on day zero of the mating period. And what this does is obviously um, have a tighter calving interval. So females carve earlier, um, are able to reconceive earlier, are producing milk earlier, or um, certainly are weaning calves heavier. And I'll show some examples of that. Um, the other thing, particularly when it comes to growth of assisted reproduction um, and improvement of genetics throughout herds, is there's no need for on-site skilled labour. Um, and this is really important for people that are, have never inseminated before. Um, you know, they basically can do a program use contract labour because things happen at certain times of the day um, or there's minimal training for the, the treatments that's required. So although I am a huge fan of fixed time AI, there's some things that we need to consider and, um, you know, the reason we need to just probably think about the reasons that um, where fixed time AI um, could be improved is that we can then look at measures to mitigate the risks that are involved with it. So although because we're submitting 100% of the females through to insemination, uh, we actually use a straw of semen for every female. Now, that, that's fine, um, but if that semen is expensive or rare, it becomes um, challenging. And we can use um, some tools to be able to um, manage that. You have to synchronise the ovulation. So um, in, a, in those that might be... Um, used to say a normal prostaglandin program where you just use a dose of prostaglandin and observe heat. There's no induction of ovulation. You basically wait for the time of heat and then you know when to inseminate the female. In fixed time AI, you must give a dose of either GnRH or estradiol to induce the ovulation at the end of the program. So therefore you have a specific timing um, of when those animals are ready to be inseminated. Remember that um, with fixed time, there's, there's females that aren't on heat or should not probably be receiving a straw of semen. It's a bell curve. Um, we synchronise the ovulation to a specific point and we hope that the females, majority of those females are there because we know and understand um, how their ovaries work. The synchrony treatments can be more expensive, um, but usually this is offset by the, the reduced handling that's required and other benefits. Um, at minimum, there's usually three to four handlings of the animals. Um, this is generally probably more apparent in a beef situation. Um, and it does require good quality semen to get optimal results. Um, as I said before, the, the timing of ovulation is a bell curve. Um, we inseminate when we expect most of the animals to be ovulating, but there's certainly going to be a tail of animals that take longer to ovulate. The better quality semen in the trap, the, the more likely it's going to sustain um, and be viable in the trap for when the ovulations occur. So generally, if, if semen's a little bit poorer quality, it, it doesn't perform as well in fixed time programs. So I'd just like to um, discuss the, the benefits of whole herd synchrony. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this within the perspective of dairy herds and in with beef herds. And when I say whole herd synchrony, essentially we're talking about fixed time AI and synchronising an entire group of animals. I'd just like to present some data um, that was generated out of a, a herd in northern Victoria. Um, it was approximately 450 dairy cows, um, sorry, crossbred dairy cows. Um, and it was a split seasonal um, milking herd. So they did approximately 60% of their breeding activities in spring and then rolled over cows um, into August. 
uh, to autumn, sorry. So if I guess my, um, and I'd say most people's indicator of reproductive success or fertility is the ability of a cow to reconceive and calve every 12 months, um, be it dairy or, or beef. Um, if a cow can achieve that, she is definitely what you would consider quite a fertile female. Now, given that there's obviously a period of gestation in the 12 month cycle, uh, what we need cows to do is we need them to reconceive within thereabouts an 83 day interval from calving. So if we look at this study, um, we had half the females were in the control group, which essentially is just cows that are typically managed um, in that region, um, where cows at mating start date, they're observed for heats and, and um, inseminated on um, presentation of estrus. If they, after a period of time, if they did not present on heat, they were deemed to be non-cycling or non-visible estrus and then they were submitted to a fixed time program. The protocol that we implemented was a fixed time AI protocol. So the entire group was um, uh, synchronized and with progesterone devices, the Qmate device um, at day zero. So they were inseminated on day zero of the mating start date. So they're actually synchronized pre um, mating start date. And what you can see here is the average days from calving to conception was 90 days for the control group and 78 days for the um, fixed time AI group. So what we did is we actually moved the average um, calving 12 days earlier by implementing the fixed time AI. Now, if we put that line of approximately 83 days on this um, plot, what we can see is that um, I'm not sure of those who know how to read a box and whisker pot, but essentially this middle line here is representative of 50% of the herd. So the fixed time AI group here, we had more than 50% of the females were likely to reconceive um, within a 12 month interval. Um, whereas the control group, the, the typical management for that region, um, it was only just over 30% that had re, um, conceived in that window. So you can see that there's um, certainly going to be production benefits for these females long term. We then transpose that information. So assuming that a cow calves earlier means that in a seasonal calving herd, um, then she'll be producing milk a day earlier um, than if she basically had to wait. So here the red curve is representative of the control group and the clear line is representative of the fixed time AI group. Now, because all females were um, inseminated on day zero, it meant that we had more cows pregnant um, earlier. Now, I assume, um, well, not assume, it's um, for every cow that calves earlier, that's one extra cow milking day um, that she is available. So by having more cows calve earlier, the area under the curve is representative of the production of those animals. So if we looked at 20 days into the, um, the calving season and assuming that all cows had the same gestation, of course, um, you would see that there was a 121% increase in production early on in the season. Towards the end of the season, although the total cumulative number of cows pregnant was similar, um, because of these early um, milking days that were achieved from the fixed time AI group, we saw a 19.8% increase in production. The interesting thing about the synchrony programs, as I mentioned, is that they actually are a remedy for um, some issues with fertility and dairy herds. And the use of a progesterone device such as the Qmate actually provides non-cycling cows a period of progesterone to kickstart them. A cow that has been an anestrus, not cycling, um, and a heifer, for it, this could be a heifer as well, when they first have their first ovulation, they haven't had a period of progesterone um, before that when they start cycling again. So by treating them with a Qmate device, giving them that period of progesterone priming actually means that their first ovulation is going to be a fertile one or more fertile. Um, and as such, um, the fixed time AI program by default, because it does utilize progesterone devices, is a very good tool for non-cycling treatments. Um, for every day, I think Dairy Australia estimates that every day a cow's not, oh, sorry, every cycle a cow's not submitted to 
AI, it actually costs um, a dairy farmer $200. So it's important to identify cows early that are not going to go and calf. Um, using programs such as OBSYNC without a progesterone device is, is effectively ineffective. Um, even if you can get non-cyclists to respond to say an OBSYNC program, generally their fertility is reasonably low. It's not just about non-cyclers though, the utilisation of progesterone devices also improves the synchronisation of ovulation. Um, the, because of regulatory restrictions around the protocols that we can use in lactating dairy cows, um, they can be a little bit hit and miss. Um, and as such, the use of a progesterone device um, definitely improves our synchrony. Um, and it also means that there's sufficient progesterone circulating um, at the time of your PG injection. And this is, can be an issue, particularly with respect to um, higher producing cows. Um, the overall metabolism of a dairy cow is quite high. And as such, you tend to, they tend to burn through some of their own um, hormones. So by supplementing them with a progesterone device such as a Qmate can be a remedy for these issues. Um, it can also be a therapy for reproductive issues um, such as cystic ovarian disease, um, silent heats um, and the phantom cow. Um, I probably won't go to too much of the phantom cow, but essentially these are cows that um, are inseminated and then you don't see them return um, and you assume they're pregnant, but they're not. Um, sometimes these are ovarian issues. Interestingly, a lot of these are actually solved through the process of fixed time AI. Um, and again, it's a situation where fixed, implementing fixed time AI early in the season actually can fix a lot of these problems and you can be proactive about the reproductive management rather than um, basically waiting for cows to present with problems um, and costing you money when they're not being presented for AI. So they were just some benefits um, from data in the dairy herds. Um, I'd just like to do the same and present some from beef. Um, these, are, these are only just some of the things that um, you know, can, can benefit individual herds. Um, and there's a lot of um, intangible benefits as well on top of these. So from the beef perspective, um, I'd just like to present some information. This is actually data out of South America. And it certainly, um, I would say, would resonate in any herds that have, um, you know, cyclicity issues, particularly your first calving females um, and what have you. Um, so in this study, they had um, Nalori cows, 594 of them. And in this process, sorry, my slides aren't working. Um, in this process, they, um, synchronize the cows on day zero, half of them, um, and the other half um, were treated differently. So the pink line represents um, the bull only. So throwing the bull in um, no synchronization treatments at all, so natural mating. Um, the green line represents conventional AI. So this is essentially heat detection. The blue line represents a fixed time AI around day 10. Um, because there was 10 days of synchronization. And then the bull basically being placed with the herd for the return heats. And the yellow line represents fixed time AI, um, but then return AI. So basically looking at heats on return and inseminating. All groups received um, exposure to the bull after day 45. So at day 45, there was a, if we talk about the cumulative pregnancies, there was 12% more between the bull um, and fixed time AI. So essentially suggesting that bulls are better at picking up um, heats than what we are. And this was certainly the case in the groups that were not synchronized. Um, the conventional AI actually had 21% less than the natural mating. The difference between just the bull, so what would be standard practice and fixed time AI plus the bull was 31%. And back as early as day 30, there was a 45% difference. The interesting thing at the end of the program, there was actually 8% more pregnant to those animals that had been exposed to fixed time AI. And this would really be attributed to the fact that we were able to get cows and calf earlier 
giving them more or synchronize them earlier, giving them more opportunities to return to heat if they weren't cyc if they didn't achieve pregnancy, sorry, and also addressing those non-cyclers. So there's various benefits from having a tighter calving interval. Um, in a beef situation, um, early calves are heavier and essentially more weight ends up with more dollars. Um, you can wean at a similar age. Um, they reach their target weights earlier. The other thing is late calving females will always be late. So a later calving female is more likely to um, struggle to reconceive the next season. And essentially she's at a higher risk of um, dropping out of your herd. So her longevity in the herd becomes a problem. This is particularly important if you're thinking about your heifers um, and your first calving um, females. Those um, females tend to struggle the most. If we can set them up early as a heifer and as a first carver through the use of fixed time AI or synchronization, it essentially sets those females up for life. This is some data directly out of the Angus Sire benchmarking program. Um, this herd um, had 225 calves born. Um, the AI calves on average were 205 days um, earlier or older at the time of weaning than the natural calves. Now, the interesting thing about this is because just me, did, sorry, due to sheer weight, um, they were 38 kilos, sorry, sheer age, they were 38 kilos heavier. Interestingly, because we had a good conception rate, these were also 71% of the calf crop. So you can just see through sheer weight and there could be a little bit of genetic improvement here adding to the weight. But again, that's the argument of fixed time AI. Um, there are dollars just in that perspective. So I'd just like to talk a little bit about the um, protocols and um, that we, we go through. And as I said, within the scope of this presentation, it's probably a little bit hard to go into nitty gritties um, in protocols. But what I would like to do is give you some tools to have better selection of your protocols um, and then talk about the procedures and, and give you some thought processes around the importance of compliance and quality control. And essentially through those, um, hopefully this will improve getting more value for money. So we think about quality assurance and compliance, and I would say that this is one of the biggest factors um, in the manage, uh, management of the program itself. Um, obviously, there's an element of managing the females, but um, in the program itself of actually getting a good outcome. So I just want to run a scenario past you and assume the best possible pregnancy rate that you, a herd can achieve is 65%. So providing everything goes well the best it can receive, um, achieve is 65%. And let's just think of the simple little things that can go wrong. So let's say there might be a mishap in synchronization treatment. So a tiny, um, you know, maybe the, the dosing gun was not 100% accurate. A couple of females were misgiving a particular treatment. It might shave 5% off your result. You may use an inexperienced technician. This is a hard one because, um, I do believe in using experienced technicians, but there's only one way to gain experience and that is certainly um, to AI lots of cows. Um, but certainly there is a technician effect. Um, maybe the semen quality is substandard. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that you've actively um, chosen a bull um, that is not correct. It just may be for some reason there was um, a quality issue. It could have been handling, um, what have you with the semen straws. Let's say the post-insemination nutritional management was not ideal. The females weren't managed forward on a plane of nutrition. And you can see just by these little shavings of results, this herd has actually been from something that could have been potential at 65% has now come back to a 45% pregnancy rate. Now, I don't want to complicate the process because the process of fixed time AI is actually quite simple, but it's just being very aware and ensuring that every step of the process is done with best practice management to ensure that um, optimal results are gained. If we think about the process of fixed time AI, 
Um, there's every little element of the process needs to be thought about, planned and managed. Um, there's pre-mating management, so it may be considering um, vaccinations for reproductive loss, um, nutrition, certainly ensuring animals are an, a rising plane of nutrition, good body condition score. Uh, there's synchronisation treatments, making sure you do have the correct protocol, you are giving the right doses according to your herd. Um, there's elements of semen quality, so the collection and management of those semen. There's the insemination itself, ensuring you have um, a technician that is experienced and doing a good job. And then there's the post mating management. So ensuring again that the nutrition um, is managed forward, um, managing the health of those females and what have you. So you can see when you break it down, there's definitely different elements where we do need to have that QA check on um, how we're managing our programs to ensure the most optimal result. As I said, it's not particularly difficult. It's just being aware and cognizant of the, the things that can go wrong. So the selection of protocols, um, in my opinion, is, is very fit for purpose. Um, and it was an excellent comment that Kai made last week. Um, and I think his comment was just because the guy down the road is getting an excellent result with a particular protocol, it doesn't mean that you can go and grab that protocol and use it on your herd and expect the same result. Um, although common protocols fix common problems, um, there is certainly, um, I would say, a cause for having a, a big think about your program and making sure the selection is done correctly. We have a little resource um, online on our Repro 360 websites under our um, common protocol section. Um, I hope with the tools um, and the discussion that um, I have uh, soon, we'll give you some um, you know, options to go in there and have a look at some different protocols. We do call them common protocols um, in the fact that a lot of um, times they can be changed, the nuances in the herd, um, or sometimes it is just the simple approach. So I certainly encourage people to go in there and have a look and then discuss them with your vet or your assisted reproduction provider. So one of the things about thinking about what protocol you're going to choose is what is the objective of the breeding enterprise? Um, no one goes out and AIs cows or embryo transfer cows for the fun of it. Um, I do enjoy AI cows, but maybe I'm a little bit strange. But essentially what you need to understand is what's the true reason for going ahead um, and trying to achieve this? What, what is the breeding objective? Usually by that, you can start to understand, um, you know, what, what is actually um, required. Is it producing more bulls? Is it producing more females? Um, is it trying to make rapid genetic change? Is it trying to... Um, improve the fertility of a herd that's calving has gone away. Um, so these conversations, um, either with yourself or your veterinarian or your um, artificial reproduction provider are very important. I think managing expectations is very important as well. Um, Overpromising can lead to a disappointing result. And that's for something um, as, as a breeder as well, just having a good understanding of the capabilities um, of your program and your herd um, and, and doing the maths and the figures around that. My um, success of an AI program is not always the big, great results. The success to me is repeatable results year on year that you can bank on and then implementation of that into normal breeding management of a herd. To me, that's when there's a big tick rather than um, the, the excellent results that you get. As much as we'll take the excellent results, I don't want to see the crashes as well. Um, under good management and controlled environments, often results are repeatable. Um, and so it's good to consider all factors um, before estimating an expectation, but also it's good to just do a little bit of a quality check on your own environment to make sure that the fundamental management issues have been addressed before investing in an assisted reproduction program. The availability and cost of labour is important. Um, understanding what on-farm staff are available. Um, the, the great thing about fixed time AI is that you don't need excellent staff. You can bring in contract um, staff to do the job. Um, if you are interested in doing some heat detection, make sure that staff are trained and willing to do it. Um, proper heat detection actually does require 
um, an investment um, in watching animals. Um, people tend to hate to do it on a Friday afternoon or over the weekend. Um, and hence why synchronization becomes um, a little bit important. So it's not that heat detection can't happen. It's just you need to do a bit of an assessment to understand whether you've got the capabilities to implement, um, whether it be more rigorous synchrony treatments or heat detection or something like that. The staff aren't available. Maybe it's better to take a keep it simple approach. One of the first questions I ask when people ring me up and um, or email me and say, you know, what's the best protocol? What's the best approach for Angus cows or what have you? And I, I come back with probably 20 more questions. Um, and one of the biggest questions um, for me is the price and availability of semen. Um, remember I said that semen in a fixed time AI program, we put a straw of semen into every female. So when the... Um, semen price is high um, or you have rare semen, um, utilising a simple fixed time AI approach may not be the best decision. Um, it's not that you can't use um, whole herd synchrony and the fixed time AI protocols. It just means that you might add some checks and balances in there, such as the use of ultrasound um, or heat detection aids such as Eastratex. Um, if we add some checks and balances in, we start to be able to identify females very quickly that have a higher likelihood of conception. So then you can choose, for example, to use, if you've got that high price semen on those females that we know have a higher likelihood, um, and then you may have other semen that's more dispensable um, to be used on those females at the tail end of the program that may not have actually demonstrated heat, um, or we know are in a lower risk category. I, I usually don't recommend not to inseminate those females because if you inseminate every female, you're going to definitely get more calves by AI and more calves, um, cows, sorry, conceiving early in the, the breeding season. And then you get all those benefits of fixed time AI as well. If semen is average to low in price, however, um, generally there is an economic argument for fixed time AI um, because it does produce more calves um, without a doubt. Um, and I've just put the two breeds on the side that are probably some of the worst offenders for high semen prices, being the Brahmin breed and the Wagyu breed. Um, and, you know, I, I definitely sort of get a little bit heightened and ask questions about price of semen when we're managing those herds. Um, one of the things that I think has got a huge, um, you know, improvement or in terms of adoption is the use of sex ordered semen. Um, and it definitely can improve our breeding um, choices. Now, the, there is a difference between sex ordered semen and conventional semen. So although technologies have improved amazingly um, of recent times, sex ordered semen's had a bit of a, um, has been through a fair bit to get where it has got to. Um, and as such, it needs to get to the finish line immediately. So those guys are the sprint runners. Um, however, conventional semen, um, they can remain in the race for a duration. So they tend to be more your marathon runners. Um, so in that sense, we want sex sorted semen must be placed into the reproduction tract close to the time of ovulation. So I'm not sure those who have um, dealt with horse breeding, um, but anyone who has knows that we scan and scan and scan and we try and pinpoint the time of ovulation the best we can. And then we put the semen into the tract. It's a very similar approach with sex sorted semen. This doesn't mean that fixed time AI isn't possible. It's just that we highly recommend that you do use checks and balances um, and, and just up the ante a little bit in terms of um, utilising heat detection aids and potentially ultrasound um, to make sure that we're selecting those females that have a higher likelihood of conception. The other question you need to ask yourself in selection of your protocols is your genotypes. Um, there are nuances between different breeds. Um, for example, heifers, we understand, um, do have a different requirement for progesterone. Um, and so selection of devices that have a, a lower progesterone. Um, there could be a high risk of postpartum anestrus in some genotypes, um, but also understanding the production limitations. So there might be some um, regions where, um, you know, just generally nutrition and the types of animals in those herds are, is not there. Um, so having that discussion a little bit around the breeds and genotypes can help selection of those protocols.
the age parity and lactation status makes a big difference. Um, generally cows that have had a calf before, so on their second calf or better, tend to give you better results, except for probably those older cows and dairy herds. Um, yearling heifers are um, often the choice for AI. They represent our newest genetics and technically our best genetics. Um, you don't have the problem of the cow and calf unit. Um, but for some reason, they routinely give us poorer results than our cows. And I don't know that anyone has really truly nailed the heifer um, concept. And if I had to point more money down to research and AI, I'd certainly be looking towards heifers. First lactation females are likely to be at risk of postpartum anaesthetics. Um, so then you would definitely consider measures um, for non-cycling. So definite use of progesterone devices, calf removal. There's lots of things that can be done there. And lastly, is the, is the facilities um, available? Um, if you are implementing heat detection, ability to, um, you know, have somewhere that drafting can be done. Um, fixed time AI generally doesn't need as good a set of um, facilities. Um, saying that better facilities, animals are happier to keep coming through the yards. Um, if, if facilities are not very, um, good for stock handling. Sometimes animals can get frustrated with the process, but more often than not, I do see um, quite a pleasurable experience for the animals. Um, so just having a little bit of an understanding of the capabilities on farm. I'm sorry, not last but least, the other issue is just to consider um, regulatory constraints. Um, you know, considering um, the fact that estradiol benzoate, it's a wonderful product, um, however, it cannot be used in lactating dairy cows and it cannot be used in EU accredited beef herds. Um, for those that have, you know, looked to the US um, and what have you for information, those guys cannot use estradiol benzoate, nor can New Zealand and nor can the EU. So um, it generally, if, if we can use it, it's great, um, but often there are regulatory issues around it. It's not based on science, it's, it's purely public perception. Um, but that will certainly tailor what program um, can be used. So thank you for your time. Um, hopefully I have run over, I think, a little bit. I'm um, sorry, it was a lot of content to fit in there, um, but more than happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Thanks so much, Sophia. That was awesome. And you can take all the time in the world, like you said, the very technical subject. So um, thanks so much for that. Um, Whilst um, we're getting a few questions come through, um, would you like to give us a bit of a brief description of um, Vetoquinol and the Repo 360 program for people that aren't aware? Um, sure. So we have a um, Repo 360 platform. Um, it's an, basically, uh, well, the Repo 360 concept is probably a greater, but what we're trying to do is... Um, improve engagement around assisted reproduction through all stakeholders in the industry. Um, and one of the central aspects of that is our online resource um, at repro360.com.au. Um, and through there, we have information on assisted reproduction technologies. Um, we have a lot of how-to videos, so to try and educate around that best practice management to ensure compliance. Um, and quality. The protocol section, which I um, briefly alluded to, um, there's a directory of artificial insemination providers. Um, and there's also um, an avenue there. There's a hotline and an, um, an expert email address, essentially, which will be able to answer any questions anyone has. Awesome. And I know you touched on the QMate products throughout your presentation as well. Um, what, what are those kind of um, leading factors as to, um, yeah, and benefits to that product? Sure. So the QMA product is probably central to our um, synchrony range. Uh, the QMA um, device is a little bit different to what um, you probably used to um, on the market. Um, However, what it does have, it's got excellent retention rates. Um, we don't see a lot of them lost. Um, in fact, a lot of our embryo transfer vets will only use Qmate because they won't fall out and that means they can turn off and flush cows. Um, the other element of the Qmate device is it actually has a flexible dosing system. Um, so when I alluded to the heifers and the requirements for progesterone, 
you basically can use one device and dose your heifers correctly. Um, and then you can use reload pods to then go through your cows. Um, there's a couple of different features, but that's probably the short and sweet parts of it. Um, yeah. I think I might have lost you, Claire. Are you still there? Oh, you're back. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I was just saying the, um, the, what you touched on at the start of your presentation around um, uh, sperm surrogacy was quite an interesting topic. And um, one of the questions that has just come through now is um, in relation to that. Um, and the question was um, if the owner had a Brahmin bull but want to, wanted to use simmentail, um, if the simmental semen was injected into the Brahmin bull, would the owner use that Brahmin bull carrying simmental genetics over his Brahmin cows? And how long would the Brahmin bull be able to produce Simbra calves? Um, so the to technology is not quite there yet in terms of, um, you know, I guess being in the industry tomorrow. Um, but essentially, I, my understanding, and it's not my forte, um, is that it is for life. So once they do transition those cells um, in the testicles of, say, the Brahmin to, say, Simmental semen, um, that bull effectively then becomes a Simmental bull or the, the quality of the bull that um, essentially was put into those testicles. So um, providing that the Brahmin, the host of um, those cells, is viable um, and can mate with the cows, he essentially then becomes that simmental bull, but tropically adapted. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of cool technology. They have yeah, done it's amazing. Um, I'm not sure where it's up to in terms of any sort of commercialization or what have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very fascinating. Um, would you like to explain, explain the new J-Sync protocol and how it's going? And um, yeah, if you could please, yeah, give us a bit of an understanding around that. Sure. So the, the J-Sync protocol um, is, is a combination protocol between estradiol and GnRH. So it's, it's more a beef um, protocol um, because of the use of estradiol, um, although it could be used in dairy heifers actually. Um, and it works on a shorter duration of cumate insertion. So um, it only leaves the cumates in for six days. But what you do at the end of the program is actually extend the period from the time of the removal of the um, cumate device and PG injection through to the time of AI. Um, at the time of AI, um, essentially then GNRH is given um, and AI at the same time. So it's only a three handling program. So it's very, very practical for implementation. The purpose of the J-Sync and why um, it's been implemented, it's, to, it's that whole extending the period from QMAT removal to AI, um, which is what we call the pro estrus period. But essentially what that does is enable a follicle to grow very well um, prior to the time of AI. So when we induce ovulation, um, it's induced um, with a bigger follicle and usually bigger results in a better fertility, um, a better response to the GNRH. And also we hope that some of the females may actually go through their own spontaneous ovulation. And again, that's going to be more fertile than, um, than one that's been induced. So I hope in a nutshell that sort of explains the benefits of the j -Sync, but it's certainly becoming the go-to program, um, particularly in Bostaurus beef heifers. Awesome. Um, so Vera, how do you consider um, the um, heifer's weight or age or how important is that when you're doing um, fixed time AI? Um, I think it's very important. One thing that's very difficult is to, um, you know, the concept of a critical mating weight always comes up in discussion. Um, the the cons that is a difficult concept because it does vary between breed, um, genotype, and age. 
um, heifer weight will be directly related to its puberty. Um, so heifers that are not up to weight um, are more likely not to be cycling, or if we flip that around, heifers that are up to weight are more likely to be cycling. Um, although we can use fixed time protocols to induce puberty in females, we're going to get better results out of those animals that are actually cycling. Um, so I, there, there's always an argument for having heifers as heavy as they can be without being over fat at the time of AI. You don't want to overfeed them and have them too fat. Um, generally, heifers that are at good weight in a good body condition score, um, so three in a beef world, but let's say good and rising plane of nutrition to at least another half or a full body condition score by the time at pregnancy diagnosis, tend to do a better job than those heifers that are over, like, you know, rolling fat. And often when you see those heifers run up the race and they're rolling fat, everyone gets excited. They're going to get a great program. Um, I tend to get more excited about those animals that are heavy, but just need a little bit more cover on them and, and on the right nutritional plane. Those guys tend to do really, really well. Awesome. Um, just one last question before we finish up. Um, what is your advice or best hormone protocol for cows that are experienced with um, heat stress? Um, this question is asked because most of the protocols applied to the dairy cows in tropical countries were not succeeded as expected due to the heat stress, which reduces the female fertility and semen viability. Um, any advice on this is greatly appreciated. Um, actually, I do. But... Um it's probably not directly related to AI. Um, unfortunately, I don't know that there would be any magic wand that um, a protocol could do to mitigate heat stress in cows because um, the, the actual issue around heat stress in cows is the development of that um, oocyte or the embryo um, moving forward. And so all the synchrony protocols do is really set that um, oocyte or that egg up ready to be um, inseminated. So if the cow's experiencing that heat stress, um, it, it's just within the cow herself. So the synchrony doesn't do much. However, um, one thing that has been demonstrated um, and is in the world of embryo transfer. So because the, the impact of heat stress is actually on the embryo itself. Um, what can be done is instead of inseminating the cows themselves, you can actually transfer embryos into them and you can actually um, improve the, um, the fertility of those animals by simply using them as recipients rather than AI because the embryo that you're putting into that animal has not been affected by heat stress. Um, and has passed those developmental stages where it um, hasn't been a problem. So um, that's my little tip for managing heat stress um, in those regions. Um, and this would apply even in areas in Australia, I suspect, particularly when it comes um, trying to get cows in calf later in the breeding season. Um, I do believe there's an article on that on the Repro 360 website. Um, I can't remember exactly where it is but i'd be definitely happy to share that if that um person asking the question gets in contact with you claire i can um, yeah absolutely i can pass through. that um pass that information on sure. um one last quick question that's quite interesting um before we finish up is do you see a benefit or better results of ai heifers that were conceived by ai or conceived by multiple generations of ai don't know we know enough about that. Um, mm. it, it's still, I, I would argue that um, animals that conceive to AI, so that are, um, let's assume that when we AI our cows, the first animals to go pregnant to AI, because we tend to start our breeding with AI, tend to be the more fertile ones. Um, fertility is heritable. Um, it, it's a multifactorial thing um, and I do would say I have a gut feeling that definitely females tend to respond to synchrony treatments there is some sort of genetic variation there um, we definitely saw when we looked at the bosinicus animals that 
um, animals that, um, so the Brahmin breed's not purely Bosinicus, there's influences of Bos Taurus genotypes. If we genotype um, the Brahmin heifers that we've AI'd over the time, what we found is those animals that had the more of the genes for the Bos Taurus elements actually responded to synchrony treatments better and went to AI. So there probably is some sort of genetic influence there. Um, there, there is a paper that I co-authored on that, but I wouldn't, I'm not a lead geneticist by any means. Um, but so all I can say is that we don't have enough information, but I guess there's enough little bits in there that would suggest potentially that um, you could definitely see um, a trend down that pathway. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sophia. We will finish up there. There are a few other questions that have popped through, but I will pass those questions on to yourself and um, you can uh, get in touch with those people um, once, we, uh, once we finish up here. Um, I'm excited to announce that next week our guest presenter will be Professor Jenny Price, who is the Principal Research Scientist at um, Agriculture Victoria. And um, Jenny will be discussing um, with us the latest research development in um, the uh, ABV system uh, following the release of new traits last April. Um, so, and she'll also be touching on um, how do we create the socially acceptable cow? So looking at pole genetics, low like methane, longevity, low stomatic cells. So a really, um, another really interesting um, presentation to come for us next week. But um, thank you so much, Sophia, for joining us. Um, like you mentioned, there's obviously a lot of information that we've, um, we've touched on tonight and all of that can be found on um, the Repro 360 site. But um, I'll also send out your details um, in the email tomorrow morning with a recording so people can get in touch with you and, and find out some more and ask some more questions. But we will leave it there. Thank you again so much for joining us. And um, yeah, I hope everyone keeps safe and well. And we'll hopefully see you all again next week. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye.